here we are. One more segment we're going to do in our decking series. Do it again. Yeah. I thought it would be interesting to get your perspective, uh, you know, deck builder, deck business owner, and just kind of some of the things you've seen. Uh, I think you started building when you were just building with wood surfaces. And then all of a sudden someday, hey, a manufactured decking product comes on the scene. And maybe you could take us from there and just some of the iterations you've seen up till today's products. Yeah, well, as you, you know, Trax was that, the first product that came out. And that was a, a combination of recycled wood and plastic and some resin. Um, and there were two colors and they both turned gray. And, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> and they, var they varied a little bit in, in width and thickness. So there was a real issue with with getting them to blend together, like if you did a butt joint. Um, uh -huh. There was also the, the fastener thing. Uh, at that time, there wasn't, they did a lot of design on fasteners over the years, but back then, you, you know, you had, you could pre-drill and countersink a screw, or you could, we were actually nailing ours, our, our, our original Galvanized casing nail or a spiral casing, casing, casing nail or casing something. nail with a, a nail gun and, uh, and going back and setting them. And um, it was, it's quite different now. Um, and there were you know, just, the products have gotten so much better and the colors are better and they're more vibrant and their the guarantees and the warranties are better. The consistency is better. Yeah. Um, one of the things that happened when you first came out with Trex, then there were a few other products that came out. And, uh, but none of them provided a fascia material, the, the, the vertical piece that goes on the side of the deck. They all had deck boards, so we would use deck boards for fascia or we'd use wood fascia okay. uh, on the decks. And when they first came out with fascia, uh, it came in a variety of links and it didn't do so well. It was um, uh, the number one callback for for us, bearing in mind we're doing about 100 decks a year, you know, was was fascia failure. It was it moving so much, it was mm -hmm. literally breaking the heads off screws. You come back to uh, a, a miter cut on a corner of a deck. You mm -hmm. know, that's, that's one of the tougher cuts to do for a carpenter it's no big deal but you can do a perfect cut and you can come back a week later and it'd be wide open and the ends would be flapping in the wind wow and uh, you either had to replace it or you had to uh, you could re-screw it down but it just never looked as good as it should have wow so how did they address some of those things i'm assuming that's not what you're dealing with today for the most part well there are um they have uh guidelines for gapping in other words uh, with a synthetic product you don't want to have anything tight together. You don't want to, like when you run two deck boards together, it's called a butt joint. Uh, you got to leave a gap there about an eighth of an inch. Uh, we got into doing divider boards. So synthetic decking comes in those three lengths. And what we would do is figure out what is the best length for this house. And we'd put a, a, a board that's basically perpendicular to all the other deck boards down the middle. So rather than doing a bunch of staggered butt joints, which are going to open regardless of what you do. They're going to move around. They just don't look good. Yeah. You could have a, a, a deck board with a gap on it, just like the deck boards going the other way. Looks really nice. And that way it can do its expansion contraction. And it looks like it's supposed to be happening. Up against that transition board. Right. Okay. And you do that gotcha. not only on the transition board, but on the edges of the deck, you picture frame you that go. deck with the same detail. So yeah. everything can expand and contract. And, and whether the gap got bigger or smaller, depending on temperature or weather or whatever yeah. it still looked like it was a finished product yeah yeah i know uh, i know a lot of research and development has gone into the the fastening methods for those and a lot of it's you know basically drilling holes bigger than the shank of the fastener and like you say letting things move a little bit almost create maybe a slip joint on you know butt joints and corners and things like that different designs are coming out to help things look uh, a little nicer but for the most part, you aren't having like that crazy oil canning effect that you'd come not, back and see two weeks later. Not having the screw heads break off yeah. is, is, yeah. is a big thing. But you're limited on length, 12 foot lengths is what you get in synthetic. So we do a lot of uh, other product. We'll buy, you know, Azac makes trim material. So we'll buy their, their white Azac trim board. Okay. And that can make a bigger span with less movement. And they also have ways to like glue the edges together and things. True. So you can do that and have True. way less impact as far as movement. Yeah. And uh, and you can fasten yeah. it differently. You don't need the same big fastener that you use on the synthetic. Yeah, and they've got some nice paintable products now too. I they think. do, so that's as a really, matter of fact. Yeah, again, another evolution. So you talked about the, you know, how far the deck, manufactured deck boards have come. Gosh, now there's, 
you know, for a while when it first, like when Azek first came out, it was just these four or five really basic pastels. You know, to me, they were kind of like vinyl <laughs> siding colors, right? You had a, a white and a cream and a light gray and a they, they maybe all about a the same, yeah. beige, but now, gosh, you know, darker colors, no problem. Streaking, texturing, all this stuff. That being said, as we've talked about before, I, I think it's still important to set ex reasonable expectations for the end user. What is your conversation to just try to keep the bar not quite so high as far as expectations on final aesthetics when your deck is built? Right. And it's back into that little bit of what we talked about earlier that, you know, I want it perfect. The, these manufactured products look so good that, uh, and the rails and everything, when you make cuts, if, if anything's off at all, where if you were building a wood deck, nobody would even notice. But you notice on a synthetic deck. So there's a real effort on our part to really put together as, as excellent a product as we can. But to get away, steer away from what you're talking about, Lisa, is that expectation of perfection. Because these things move. They're going to expand and contract. And they're built tough. They're built to be used. But you're going to be dragging stuff across it and things like that. So you're going to inevitably get some scratching and dinging over time yeah. like you would on any other surface. But, uh, you know, one of the analogies I used to make with a, a homeowner because I used to say one of the big things was it's, it's um, maintenance free. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. And there were people that didn't clean their decks yeah. ever. Yeah. Well, think about your car. Park it out in the road. Don't wash it for two years. Yeah. It's going to be growing stuff on it. So yeah. You know, you got to use some common sense and understand that you've got to do some maintenance on your deck. You got to clean it and you've got to be aware that it's, you know, it's going to take some wear and tear over yeah. time. It's still going to look 10 times better than, than the wood deck you had before that you had to stain every year. Yeah. But it will get some nicks and dings over time. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been a fun segment. I appreciate you uh, giving us your take on the last few decades of manufactured decking progress. Thank you, Joe.